What's up, everybody, and welcome back to Fireside Giants. I'm your host, Anthony Rivardo, joined by my co-host, Alex Wilson. And damn it, Joe Shane did it again. Another blockbuster trade right at free agency. Of course, last year, Darren Waller trade. This year, Brian Burns from the Carolina Panthers. The Giants sent a second and a fifth round pick over to the Carolina Panthers. They got Brian Burns, a great pass rusher, but they also paid him an absolute boatload. $30 million per season, $150 million maximum. It's a big contract. It's a big trade. We got some big thoughts in this reaction video on this Brian Burns trade. As a side note, the Giants also went ahead and signed Jermaine Illuminor. You guys are probably familiar with him because we've been talking about him for quite a while. We had you guys in the loop on that. We told you he was coming to the Giants to lock it in. I remember Alex specifically saying he's a giant lock it. You were right, Alex. Good job. We knew that one was coming. But Brian Burns, we didn't necessarily see that one coming. I did mention it briefly in the episode that we posted earlier today because there were some rumblings. We heard some things, but it really came to fruition today. Huge deal. Maybe the biggest trade that happened in the NFL uh, during this free agency period. Maybe even the biggest move in the NFL. The Giants out here making moves. But again, there's some pros and some cons to this deal. And I want to go ahead and dive into it. But before we do so, leave a like if you enjoy. Subscribe if you're new. Ring the bell. Drop your comments down below. Follow us on social media at Fireside Giants. But without further ado, Alex, let's waste no more time. What is your reaction to this crazy Brian Burns trade that the New York Giants just pulled off? Guys, this one came out of nowhere, and it's funny because someone was in Anthony's DMs on Friday saying, "Yeah, by the way, uh, Brian Burns is signing with the, is going to be traded to the Giants," and then dropped the exact contract and draft capital exchange, which is shout the funniest Ricky. thing ever. Yeah, shout out Ricky, <laughs> randomest thing I've ever seen. Has two hundred followers on Twitter. Slides into Anthony's DMs. Anthony ignores it, thinks it's a girl wanting his number. No, it's Ricky, <laughs> freaking down bad Ricky, trying to convince us that Brian Burns is coming to the Giants and. By God, he was freaking right. I, I, I honestly was like blown away, and he nailed the draft. Second and a fifth round pick, and the one, the five years, one fifty. Like couldn't have been more spot on. So, I mean, wow, today has been quite the uh, insane day. Anthony clocked out for like two hours, and we acquired like three players in that time span. So it was kind of a crazy scenario. But you know, for the Giants, you wake up this morning, and for fans like us, we get Devin Singletary, and we get you know uh, John, you know whoever his name is. It's it's just kind of an interesting scenario to see how the Giants' free agency, um, Rod John Tunyon, I forgot his last name for a second, is but it's kind of crazy how this free agency, the first day, has unfolded, in the sense that we woke up, saw a couple of like eh, moves, and then suddenly we're like, holy crap, this team is actually going to go somewhere potentially. You know what I mean? They set themselves up really really interestingly in this Brian Burns trade. Um, you basically flip Leonard Williams. I mean, yes, it was the, it was the 39th overall pick that we moved, but if you think about it in the in the context of, you know, eight picks back. Let's say basically we traded that uh, second round pick back eight spots and got Brian Burns in exchange. Obviously, you have to pay him, but he's a developed player, right? He's he's one more notch in Joe Shane's belt he doesn't need to actually address. And that was kind of the priority going into the free agency class and, and and obviously the draft class was we need a top tier pass rusher. We were talking about Daniil Hunter. Um and we were gonna we were like, we're okay paying him a lot of money. He wanted twenty seven to thirty million dollars. He's twenty nine years old. We get Brian Burns at twenty five years old. So it's a little bit of a different mentality here. Um, we're going a lot younger at some spots. I think they will uh, sign a couple of veterans to address some other positions at much cheaper alternative prices, um, like safety, for example. But this was evident that Joe Shane, in his equations, I mean, we've been talking about, you know, we've been hammering home positional value for a long time, got rid of Saquon Barkley, cut about $7 million off of that by signing Devin Singletary, who, by the way, averaged more yards per carry than Saquon last year. In no means am I saying that he's better than Saquon because he's not. Um, but he was a productive running back this past season, and he is a productive running back. He's going to be a very solid player for us, in my opinion. Um, it's basically going to be a two-year contract and an out after the second season if I estimate how the contract will be structured. But Brian Burns on a five-year, $150 million deal, $87.5 million guaranteed. That is legit money. That's a big-time payday. Where is that money coming from, some people might ask. Well, guys, if you remember previous episodes, I've discussed the Daniel Jones contract many a time. And next year, if the Giants take the out in the Daniel Jones contract, they can they can actually save a maximum, and it's fits like a glove of thirty million dollars, right? Brian Burns is a thirty million dollar cap hit. Daniel Jones opens up a maximum of thirty million dollars next year and two thousand twenty six. Actually, more in two thousand twenty six. So, 
the writing's on the wall. The Giants are probably 99.9% going to take the out in Daniel Jones' contract. They are flipping that money into a star pass rusher. What does that tell us, though, going into the draft? We now have the pass rush position locked up and loaded. We went out and got Jermaine Illuminor, who's a good right tackle. He's going to be probably starting there, if I had to guess. He's going to beat Evan Neal for that job, in my opinion. So now you have the tackle. You have the guard. You have the pass rusher. What's left? The receiver and the quarterback. Those are the two positions the Giants need. And they kept one of those second-round picks, the 47th overall pick, in what is one of the, if not the most, deep draft class at wide receiver we have ever seen. I mean, Anthony, you and I, this is probably the deepest receiver class we've ever seen since covering uh, the Giants in the NFL. So, you know, the writing's on the wall to me, guys. That 47th pick is going to be most likely a receiver, and I think that sixth pick is going to be used on a quarterback. That's my hot take. Maybe not so hot take right now. People may disagree. Am I going to be upset with Malik Neighbors or Romo Dunze? No, I'm freaking not, okay? If they get either of those guys, I'm absolutely happy. I am going to wonder what the hell we're doing at quarterback long term, but I'm not going to be upset about landing a blue chip prospect that that's for sure. Uh, but Anthony, you know, looking at what the Giants have done today, the positions they've addressed on multi-year deals, these aren't one-year contracts like we did last year with Paris Campbell and, you know, Sean Robinson. These are two, three-year deals, five-year deals for some of these guys. What does this tell you about what you think their draft uh, strategy looks like now, where their capital needs to be allocated to keep building this team? And obviously your thoughts on the Brian Burns trade um, in general. I think it's a little bit murky waters. I, I can't really predict now what the New York Giants are doing in the draft. When they had those two second round picks, I felt pretty confidently that they were going to leverage one of them to trade up and try and draft a rookie quarterback. Uh, but now that they don't have two second round picks, trading up to draft a rookie quarterback is going to leave you with zero second round picks because it's definitely going to cost you at least one of those seconds. And that's not ideal to me. So that's where when you want to look at pros and cons, and I'm not saying this is a bad trade by any means or anything like that. What I'm saying is, that second round, having those two draft picks, and I even made this argument against trading up for a quarterback in a recent episode, Alex. I wanted those two second round picks. I thought that those were tremendous value to the Giants. I thought that you could land a good wide receiver and a good pass rusher. That was one of the things that I mentioned. But instead of taking a chance on a Chop Robinson or a rookie pass rusher that you need to develop, the Giants are taking one of those second round picks and landing a proven talent in the NFL. Brian Burns, a really good pass rusher who's been stuck in a really crappy situation with the Carolina Panthers. So before I talk more about the draft and the implications that this has on the draft, Alex, I do want to talk about the player, Brian Burns. What is he bringing to this New York Giants team? Well, it's kind of tough to visualize exactly what it's going to look like because we haven't seen Shane Bowen's defense just yet. We don't know if he's going to be playing more of a 3-4, more of a 4-3. He ran a very multiple front in Tennessee. However, that was a lot of uh, Mike Vrabel influence. So what exactly is Shane Bowen's defensive scheme going to look like? I'm not 100% sure. But one thing that I do know about Brian Burns, in the past, he's played in a 4-3 as a defensive end. And last season, they had him standing up as an outside linebacker in a 3-4. So either way, the Giants are good. He's a scheme fit. He can play in either scheme and he can be efficient in either scheme. And in fact, I think he'll be really efficient if they are multiple in their front and they move him around and they put him down on the line and they put him outside at linebacker. So that's a good pro to this equation, right? That's a that's a solid talking point to, to kind of key in on and say Brian Burns scheme fit. Now, here's the other thing. We knew that they needed to get pressure off the shoulders of Kayvon Thibodeau. They were asking way too much of him. It was Kayvon and then it was Jihad Ward for most of the season or Tom and Fox. And every now and then it would be Aziz, Aziz Ojolari when he was healthy. But now you've got Aziz Ojolari playing as that third pass rushing role, that rotational guy. That I like. That's a good role for Aziz Ojolari. I think that we talk a lot about how this is going to affect other players, and we can on guys like Kayvon Thibodeau. He's no longer the main edge rusher. Now, Brian Burns is the main edge rusher. Kayvon Thibodeau is the number two. That should be really solid for Kayvon. Defense is keying in on Brian Burns. But what I really love about this is that the Giants are now getting back to their roots, what made them such a good team in the 2000s. They didn't just have one good enough pass rusher. Now they have a solid stable of pass rushers. They have two pass rushers who have not reached their potential yet, Burns and Thibodeau, who could both be great, maybe elite players. Plus they have Aziz Ojolari, who, when he's healthy and is on the field, has proven to be a good player. Now he's on the field less. Maybe that means he stays healthy more, and maybe that means he plays even better. So now you got a solid stable of three edge rushers. Plus, we also sometimes forget to bring him into this equation here, Alex. We do have one of the best pass rushing interior defensive linemen in football, if not the best, in Dexter Lawrence. So what the Giants are building here is a mean front four unit. Now, who's going to play alongside Dexter Lawrence as the interior defensive lineman? We'll see. But 
on the edge. I mean, uh, you can't ask for much better than this. I mean, Kayvon Thibodeau, if he continues to develop, if he reaches his potential, if he has another double-digit sack season, maybe Br- Brian Burns also has a double-digit sack season, well, I think that Dexter Lawrence, he's probably not even peaked yet. Maybe he can have a double-digit sack season, considering he's going to have way less uh, double teams coming his way now with Brian Burns. And that's really what this opens up here. Less double teams for other players, more one-on-one blocking opportunities. Oftentimes, you'll see really good, talented pass rushers on NFL teams not put up the stats that you want them to, not get after the quarterback as efficiently as you want them to, but it's because they're like the whole pass rush package for a defense. And there's not a bunch of guys, so they're not opening up a whole bunch of pass rushing lanes and one-on-one opportunities. But that's not the case now for the New York Giants. That's what was happening to Thibodeau. But now they have three really good pass rushers, four good ones if you want to throw Aziz into this mix. And, you know, let's see what they do in the draft. Maybe they add another interior rusher with some pass rushing upside. They've got a lot of guys up front who create mismatches against offensive lines and will create one-on-one blocking opportunities and pass rushing opportunities. So that's what's so great about this. The Giants secondary took a hit today. They lost Xavier McKinney. Their pass coverage, probably not going to be as good. But one way to supplement not having the best defensive backfield, to have a really mean front four and a really nice front seven. If you want to take it to another level, also include Bobby Okereke and Micah McFadden into this mix. This is a really nice front seven that the New York Giants are building. So you want to build up in the trenches? That's how you create better pass coverage. If quarterback has to get the ball out of his hands quicker, means it's less time for receivers to get open. So this is going to have a trickle-down effect. You're going to see better opportunities for Kayvon, better opportunities for Sexy Dexy, Brian Burns is going to do his thing, Z's is going to do his thing, and the pass coverage unit is going to benefit from having such a solid stable of pass rushers in front of them. So there's a lot to love about this move. This is a really solid personnel move. Like, this is a great talent that the Giants are adding here, and their front seven is going to be really, really nice this upcoming season. A very scary pass rushing quadro, I would even say. I was going to say trio. I want to throw it up to a quadro because I, I do believe in a rotational role, Aziz Ojolari can be pretty effective as a third down pass rusher. So those are the things I love. Now, you ask me, what is it, what are the implications on the draft in my eyes? It's a little bit tough to tell because, like I said, Giants no longer have two second-round picks. So what if they do want to trade up for a quarterback? Are they going to have to sacrifice that only second-round pick that they have? Maybe they trade their future first-round pick, and that's how they move up. And maybe they get their quarterback that way. Maybe they stick and pick at six, take the best player available, whether they think that's a quarterback or a receiver. I'm not exactly sure. So I I was actually a little bit surprised, Alex, to hear you say that you feel like this dictates a specific move to you in the draft. Like you were basically saying the quarterback at six and, you know, wide receiver at 47. I don't see it as clearly as that. I think that this makes things pretty difficult to kind of interpret. I'm not sure which direction the Giants are planning on going in here. Um, And so we'll see. It's a long time between now and the draft. But one thing that I do know, the main takeaway from us, the New York Giants are a better football team now. That's something that you could take away. They could have gone second round pick and taken a pass rusher on a rookie deal and, you know, tried to develop him. And granted, this is a lot of money to be paying a pass rusher that's never played for your team anymore, you know, who's had some really good seasons but hasn't reached his potential. It's a lot of money for Brian Burns. But then again, that second round pick for a proven commodity, a good football player, it's a it's a pretty exciting proposition here. So Alex, I know I didn't really answer half of your question there because, again, I don't really know what the answer is for the NFL draft. I'm still kind of piecing that to piecing that together. But I do, you know, I kind of gave the breakdown there on the player, Brian Burns, and I, I think that's exciting. I want to hear your take, though. Like, what is your reaction to the contract? I know that you kind of d- dived into it a little bit and mentioned how it frees things up or, or you know, how the Daniel Jones deal is probably going to be done next year and that frees things up. But, like, overall... How comfortable are you with the fact that the Giants, you know, are making this bold decision? This is a risk. This is a bold decision to pay this guy all this money. He's never played for this team. Pass rusher coming from another team. You feel confident that this is a contract that he could live up to? Well, I think we have to kind of look at a couple different things. And one of the really interesting things about this trade is that because they signed him to an extension after the trade was processed, the Giant it doesn't count against the compensatory pick formula. So the Giants actually will get compensatory picks for Saquon Barkley and McKinney leaving this offseason, um, which could be as much as a third-round pick, maybe two next year. So that's a really important piece of information um, because they didn't sign a free agent pass rusher like a Bryce Huff or a Daniil Hunter. They actually walk away with draft capital next year because they traded for Brian Burns. So that fifth-round pick, 
does not matter, right? You end up getting a third maybe next year because of uh, this deal, how they operated because of the, what they did. Um, but in terms of $30 million per season, yeah, it's a lot. $87.5 million guaranteed. I think this is a fine deal. Why? They're going to load the dead money into the first two years or three years of this contract. So if it doesn't work out and the Giants decide, well, you know what? It's not worth it three years from now. They'll get out of the deal. He'll be 28 years old. But the thing is, it's a, it's a high risk. It's sorry, It's a low risk, high reward type of scenario because the low risk here is that he's 25 years old. He's in the middle of his prime. Um, the, the risk is you're paying $30 million to a player that Andre Patterson, you give him to and see what more he can get out of a player who's already a star, right? He's already one of the best pass rushers in the game. Um, and from an athletic standpoint, he's a super athlete. He's a freak. He's a freak of nature who's on a bad team. Um, if the Giants maximize their potential alongside Kayvon Thibodeau and Dexter Lawrence, Brian Burns is going to have a lot of 1v1 scenarios, and he's going to win a lot of 1v1 pass rush reps, and so is Kayvon Thibodeau. Um, so I feel pretty confident we're going to get a lot of value out of that out of that deal. And based on the fact that the that the salary cap was estimated to be $245 million this year and actually ballooned to 255 the cap, the cap is going to keep going up, you know, even if it's five to ten million dollars over the next five seasons. Three years from now, thirty million dollars is going to be an absolute bargain for a twenty five year old pass rusher. You know what I mean? So, thirty million dollars now. Joe Shane's been pretty good about the cap space um, up to this point. He's made the right investments. He's understood how the cap is is moving. He's prepared himself for the opportunity to spend big, but also protect long term. I think that he's earned the right to be respected when it comes to manipulating the cap to favor the Giants. He got a lot of bad deals, didn't make any bad uh, contracts, a lot of one-year deals last year that have no impact on this season. I think that I respect him enough when it comes to the cap that I that I agree that this is a good move because in a couple of years, you know, if you're if there's another 20, like Kayvon Thibodeau, if he ever reaches Brian Burns' potential and he's 25 years old and he's in line for a big deal, he's going to get 35 mil per year. You know what I mean? Like that's where this is going. I'm actually curious to see what Daniil Hunter gets at 29 years old to see if he gets uh, like 30 mil at, at that age because that would be really good for the Giants in terms of justifying the value that they just invested in and the capital they invested in Brian Burns um, if that if that money um, is certainly matches up. So we'll see obviously how the market develops there. Bryce Huff got 17 million, which is far below, but Bryce Huff is also very young, did not play that many snaps last year. Not a great run blocker, uh, run defender, rather. So he's a really good pass rusher, tremendous piece in that regard. And he's going to be awesome for the Eagles, obviously. But, um, you know, he is limited in some capacity. I do think he's going to be really, really freaking good. So, you know, looking at what the Giants have now in terms of this uh, this three-headed monster in the interior of their defense, they forfeited, and, and this is back to the positional value conversation, they said, we don't want to pay a safety. We don't want to pay a running back. We'd rather take that money and invest it in an elite pass rusher. And most would agree the way the NFL is going in terms of positional value, that makes logical sense. Of course, like you lose McKinney, who's a big piece, and now you have to compensate for that. But is the impact that Brian Burns, the impact he's going to make on the defense more than what Xavier McKinney was going to bring? Probably. Uh, long term, so you know we'll see how this goes. It's it's too it's too soon to tell. You know you kind of referenced it earlier. It's just too soon to say how you know you can gauge this. But at face value, instant reaction, I love this for the Giants because it creates something truly special. It goes back to our roots, man. Justin Tuck, OC Strahan, all those pass rushes we had up in the middle, and and how they fueled our championship runs, fueled our defense, and. We haven't had that in so freaking long, you know? Like, I'm, I'm happy that we're going back to our roots, focusing on the pass rush, and now we have investments. All of our big investments are at key linchpin positions of core positional value spots, left tackle, um, you know, interior defense, Dexter Lawrence. Uh, he, he's a freak of nature. He's one of the best defenders in football. Uh, Brian Burns, you know, we have no money else really invested anywhere else besides those spots now, except for Daniel Jones, who's, and by the way, this contract, like I said before, kind of, to me at least, writing on the wall, they can't sign anybody else, they can't make any more acquisitions, they can't pay their future draft classes unless they have that $30 million next year and then the future, like they just don't have any more money to spend, so if they're going to make more moves, if they want to keep building, Daniel Jones is not going to be a part of these plans, in my opinion, uh, financially, it doesn't add up to me. Maybe others would disagree. Maybe you want to keep restructuring contracts and pushing it down the road. We've seen Joe Shane does not want to do that. 
Um, it's written all over his his strategy. He doesn't like pushing and, re- and voiding years and pushing dead money down the road and kicking the can like Dave Gettleman did. Not part of his game, his game plan. So I do think that he's trying to not do those things like restructure Dexter Lawrence and Andrew Thomas before he necessarily has to. Um, so we'll see how they operate there, obviously. But to me, it just, I mean, it just really screams Daniel Jones is that contract is where the money's coming from. I mean, it matches up perfectly with Brian Burns' contract and his cap hit and, you know, his yearly salary. So maybe it's just me putting the pieces together and looking at it the wrong way, but at least that's how I'm kind of uh, digesting it right now. Yeah, and I think that's, you know, it's a good analysis of it and a good take on it. I, I think it'll be interesting, though, to see how they structured this contract. I'm very curious to know that. Uh, where is the money really loaded? Is it front loaded? Is it back loaded? If they're kicking it down the can, you know, if it's a if it's a back loaded contract, that would make sense because you know that the salary cap is going to continue to rise. But that would also be an interesting strategy because it probably tells you they want to make more moves in the now rather than in the later. So I'm very curious to see when the structuring of the contract comes out where they put all of that guaranteed money in the deal. So that's something to keep an eye on. We'll, of course, update you guys on that whenever it happens or whenever the news comes out on that contract. But there is another signing that we do need to discuss, Alex. Jermaine Illuminor. Again, we got to give ourselves pats on the back. You and I both, we pinpointed this guy. As soon as Carmen Brissolo was hired, I went in. I was in the lab. I was writing my article. I love that. Love that jersey, Alex. Singletary on the back. That's great. And you know what? For what it's worth, we also pinpointed Devin Singletary like weeks ago to the New York Giants. So we're doing a pretty good job here. I, I, you know, I, on Twitter, I put out my predictions today. If you guys don't follow me, didn't see that. I went like 0 for 8. I, it was, I was like, they won't make a blockbuster trade. They're going to make a splash on the offense. Like it didn't happen. But, you know, that's okay because on the channel, we've been talking about a lot of different moves and predicting them. And they came true. So I'm happy about that. Like I said, when Carmen Bristol was hired, I wrote an article immediately. Here's three offensive linemen that they could sign with a connection to him. Alex jumped on this pod and said, lock in Jermaine Illuminar. Here he is. So, you know, Alex, I'll, I'll just hand it to you because I know you're probably super excited to talk about Jermaine Illuminar. You know, what's your reaction to this sign? I'm, I'm sure you're happy about it. Yeah, this is one I've been and we've been really calling for months now. Like the second they signed or they hired Carmen Brasillo, we were like, this is the guy that they're going to sign. Like it was bar none. You know, we also uh, mentioned Greg Van Roten happier we got Tunyon because he's just better. Um, but, you know, this is just a really good scenario for the Giants, man. I mean, look, Jermaine Illuminar is 29 years old. This is, if you want to, if you want to talk about, and I'm about to get passionate, man, because it's, it's fueling, it's running through my freaking veins right now. If you want to talk about value, absolute value, a two-year, $14 million deal for Jermaine Illuminar is absolute freaking value. That is what value looks like because Jermaine Illuminor, my friends, is going to immediately compete at right tackle and probably beat Evan Neal for the starting right tackle job, if we're being quite honest. However, he also has 534 snaps um, playing right guard in his career and 422 at left tackle. If the Giants ever need to replace uh, Andrew Thomas due to injury or whatever, they can move Jermaine Illuminor over to left tackle, kick Neal back out to right tackle. I think personally, Joe Shane and Brian Dable said to themselves this offseason after this past campaign, we are never going through what we just went through with the offensive line again in our careers. What happened last year was the absolute worst case scenario that it really happens when you don't have enough talent and you have no freaking money because Dave Gettlebaum comes out here and spends stupendous amount of money on the worst positions possible and straps the future GM down with void years and dead cap hits that make absolutely no freaking sense. Like toddler with a freaking crayon type shit. Sorry for my language. It really, really frustrates me what Gabe, what Dave Gellman did to this roster and that we had to wait until year three for Joe Shane to actually execute a game plan. Um, and, and look, Jermaine Illuminor, it makes so much sense. Last year, he was a very solid player. 28 pressures allowed, six sacks over 905 offensive snaps. Really good run blocker. He's going to fit this blocking scheme like a glove. Devin Singletary, we're going to get more value out of Devin Singletary as a running back than we have that from Saquon Barkley over the last three years for the simple fact our offensive line is going to be better. And Devin Singletary is not a bad player either. I think he's going to average 4.1 plus yards per carry in a system that two years ago had the number one running quarterback, uh, uh, rather number one rushing running back in Josh and Josh Jacobs with the Raiders. Two years ago, the Raiders had the top <laughs> running uh, the top rushing attack in football. Last year, they had the 13th ranked pass protecting unit with a band of misfit toys. Aside from Jermaine Illuminor, they had Greg Van Roten, who if you know any Jets fans, and I have a lot of them, all said he was the worst offensive guard they've ever seen. 
Carmen Brasillo somehow managed to make this guy look competent. Um, so, you know, better than anything we had, that's for sure. I, I really think that this is going to be one of the value grabs of the season. I'm really surprised he only went for two years, seven, uh, 14 million. Really surprising to me. I thought another team would give him at least 10 based on how, how much uh, players were getting. Um, you know, again, 29 years old, a little bit older, but two years of this, he's going to be your starting right tackle on day one at an, at least an average level above average run blocker, average pass protector. That is better than we've had a right tackle in the better part of a decade. Right? So I'm pretty confident this is going to be one of our best low key. Maybe he doesn't blow us out of the water. Maybe he doesn't like, you know, shock us with his incredible uh, production, but he is going to be a solid player that we don't have to necessarily worry about all the time. Every single week, we had to worry about Evan Neal failing. Every single week, we had to allocate our tight ends to block um, on, the, on the side, on the right side, because we simply could not block anyone there. You know how hard it is when you have to take your tight end out of doing their job because your right tackle cannot survive alone? It basically takes an important passing piece out of your offense. Daniel Bellinger, why do you think we barely saw his ass last year? Because the guy was helping Evan Neal block at right tackle or helping whoever was playing left tackle block. Luminaire is going to be a really solid player for us at an absolute bargain price. And at right guard, you know, we'll see. Evan Neal, maybe he kicks in. Maybe Illuminor kicks in. Maybe Ben Bredesen wins that job. We'll see how they go. Who, who, who knows? Maybe Josh Azudu steps in or Marcus McCathan takes a big step forward. You never know. But right now, this is one of the deals, Anthony. We were hammering weeks, months ago. And I'm so glad they did it because it just made too much freaking sense. And the Giants made a right move here. They brought on a guy that already has two years of experience in this blocking scheme. He's going to fit in like a glove. He doesn't have to learn much about it. It's going to be instant, inst you know, you talk about instant impact. Those are the type of moves that make instant impacts. Yeah, and, and the familiarity here is really important. Like you mentioned, that connection, knowing this blocking scheme, knowing Carmen Brislow, his coaching style, all that stuff. This is really great. I think that the Giants needed to get at least somebody in here with a connection to Brislow just to have that kind of continuity, that carryover, you know, have somebody who understands his style and understands what he's trying to implement for the offense. It's really important. So I love this deal. This is maybe for the for the value and the bargain that it is. It's maybe my favorite deal that the Giants made today. I can't find any cons. Like I, I mentioned a couple cons, you know, pros and cons to the Brian Burns deal. But this one for Jermaine Illuminor, everybody wins, right? Illuminor has got an opportunity to fortify an offensive line, which has sucked for a decade. Um, and then the Giants have an opportunity to finally get some stable quality in at, at offensive tackle. So what does this mean for Evan Neal, though? I think is an interesting question. Does this mean that Neal is definitely moving into guard? I don't necessarily think so. I think that him playing guard is on the table now, though. You know, that's for sure. It, moving him around and seeing where he can play. But really, I think that Evan Neal, what this means is show up to training camp Put up or shut up, you're going to be moved if you don't perform well. So it's a competition, I think. I think he's still going to have a chance to start at right tackle, Evan Neal. They did invest a lot in him. You know, he was a seventh overall pick a couple of years ago. So I think they still want him to win that starting job. And if that's the case, then you've got great depth in, in, in Jermaine Illuminor, who, let's face it, this offensive line has been banged up a lot. You know, they've had a lot of injuries in recent years on the line. You needed somebody who's stable and could be solid depth. But I do think... Illuminor is going to win the starting job. I have little faith in Evan Neal. But say Evan Neal balls out in training camp and gets the starting right tackle job, hell yeah, that's perfect. Just means we have great depth on the offensive line with Jermaine Illuminor. But I think that Illuminor is going to be your starting right tackle. Let's see where they move Evan Neal. Probably in at right guard. I think they want to have John Runyon in at left guard, who I think is going to be a ma major upgrade there. So on paper... Alex, this offensive line improved almost night and day, I, I would argue. Hopefully, John Michael Schmitz takes that step forward. That's going to be huge. But for what it's worth, and I think this is a point that we haven't really even made on the channel yet, Alex. I don't know if you saw the Las Vegas Raiders re-signed Andre James today, their center. I believe he was an undrafted player was not known, nobody really thought that he was going to be anything, or maybe he was a draft pick, I don't remember, but Andre James just got the bag today, the Raiders said we can't lose this guy, he wasn't really much of anything, Carmen Brissolo comes in, coaches him, and he turns into one of the best centers in the NFL, so keep that in mind, we've we've criticized Bobby Johnson like endlessly, <laughs> what he did to our offensive line was messed up, right, but now we've got Carmen Brissolo in here, we are confident in him, we've seen him develop a center from nothing into a high quality starter before, I think you can expect a pretty big step forward from John Michael Schmitz this year, especially considering he's going to be healthier. He was injured all through his rookie season. That definitely messed him up. Healthy John Michael Schmitz plus an offensive line coach who's developed a really successful center in the past. 
I think you're going to see a big step forward from the Giants' 2023 second round pick. And then again, I think you could see some progress from Evan Neal. I think he could get better this year, hopefully in at guard. And Jermaine Illuminor just plays right tackle. We know left tackle is fortified. And then, you know, you got John Runyon. Hopefully he steps in at left guard and improves. So I think that overall today, Alex, the theme of the day, you know, last year I had the theme of the offseason was flexibility. This year, I would say that the theme is trenches. The Giants have really prioritized offensive line, defensive line. And you know what, guys? That is where you win in this NFL. You win through the trenches. You build through the trenches. And that's what the New York Giants prioritized today. And that's what they accomplished. Their trenches are better. Offensive line is better. Defensive line is better. Hopefully it translates to more wins. Hopefully they could be a successful team. But the one big question mark still hanging overhead, who's throwing the football? Is it going to be Daniel Jones? Is it going to be a rookie? Are they going to sign somebody? Jacoby Brissett just got signed by the New England Patriots, which keep that in your, keep an eye on that. The Patriots signing Jacoby Brissett Brissett could start this season for them. They could trade that third overall pick to the Giants if the, if the Giants do get interested. I think that's a really slept-on move that happened today, Alex, that we hadn't even discussed yet that uh, we got to keep an eye on. So it was a hectic day. There was a lot going on. I left for two hours to play in a flag football game. My team got its ass whooped. I come back. I see Brian Burns is now on the New York Giants. What a crazy evening I've had. What a crazy day all of us Giants fans have had. It's been really exciting, though, and I'm really happy that we were able to cover it all right here on Fireside Giants for you guys. And again, once again, I've been thank you guys a lot lately, but I, I got to keep doing it for all the support you're showing. Thank you for tuning in, being here for every episode. Know you love these double uploads and hearing our reactions to all this stuff. Stay tuned because every move that the New York Giants make, short form, long form videos, everything right here on Fireside Giants. So, Alex, I'm going to wrap it unless you got any closing thoughts here on these two big moves that the Giants made. I mean, look, guys, we got a lot better today at some spots. We got a lot better in terms of if you value positional value. We certainly got better there. The offensive line, it got better. Um, our draft plans, which we'll probably start to break down in fine detail, just changed. Because, you know, we talked about Chop Robinson and Darius Robinson. And, you know, we talked about all these really good pass rushers that we could target in the first round, or the, rather, more like the second round. We don't need them anymore. You know, like, cross them off the list. You don't need them anymore. So... Uh, really takes a big kind of uh, a big hole that we had, and you know it's solved now. So offensive line, you know, right tackle Jermaine Illuminor. And I was just looking at a stat, dude. By the way, Jermaine Illuminor was one of the better guards. It was one game last year we gave up, I think, eight pressures against the Chargers. Um, that was his worst game by a significant amount. Yeah, seven pressures against the Chargers in Week Four. If you take that away, he only gave up twenty one pressures his whole year. I know, like omitting stats, like kind of stupid. But he had one, like, true outlier that was like, hmm, that's not great. And the other, like, kind of bad game he had was against TJ Watt. And, like, he makes everyone look like an idiot. So I feel like, you know, Jermaine Illuminor's value grab there. I think uh, Runyon, value grab there too. $10 million, yeah, it's not the best deal in the world. Probably could have gone a little bit cheaper. But, you know, look at what Robert Hunt got. Look at all these, all these other guys got. And um, Runyon was displaced out of his position because Elton Jenkins is so good. They want him at left guard, so they moved Runyon over to right guard. And I think the value is certainly there for him to go play left guard full-time for the Giants and be a very good pass protector. He's a very, very good pass protector. And Carmen Brasillo knows how to get maximum value out of run run up blockers. So maybe he'll develop a little bit more there too. I think he's only 25 years old, 26 years old. Guy's still young. So, you know, lots of developmental upside. We'll see how the Giants go about this. And then and tomorrow, the cornerback market was quiet. The receiver market was quiet. I think they go out and get a cornerback tomorrow most likely. So we'll get you guys covered on that front as always. But I'm happy, man. I think the Giants got better today, personally. I think that we are, we've cornered ourselves into selecting a receiver or a quarterback in this draft class. And to be honest with you, I'm happy because that means we solved a lot of weaknesses on this roster. And, um, you know, we, we focus on positions that make true impacts in games. Losing McKinney absolutely blows. But I think if we were going to replace him with anybody, Brian Burns certainly isn't a bad consolation prize. Yeah, you could say that again. I mean, listen, essentially what happened here, the Giants, if you look at the average annual value of Xavier McKinney's contract and Saquon Barkley's and you add them together, it comes out to $30 million. Instead of paying those two players, they paid the one player in Brian Burns $30 million. So you take from that what you will. Either you like it, maybe you don't like it. I think most Giants fans do like this move, though, and I agree with you, Alex. I said that as well. I think the New York Giants are a better football team today than they were yesterday because of the moves that they made today, especially in the trenches. So, 
lot to be excited about, a lot to talk about. We'll continue to talk about it right here on Fireside Giants. So make sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this episode. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Ring the bell so you don't miss an episode and comment your thoughts down below in the comment section. If you're listening to Apple or Spotify, please make sure to leave us a five-star review. Go ahead and follow us on all of our social media channels at Fireside Giants. Without further ado, we'll catch you all in the next one. Have a good one, and let's go Giants. Thank you.